Hello. Hello. I am Patrick. And I am Nick. And this is Dialectic Chaos, Episode 6, in which we compare different kinds of live shows. This is very much a Nick Finally. inspired. Yes, very much a Nick We're not inspired. doing albums. Nick inspired podcast. He is much more of a live show guy than an album guy. I am very focused on albums. And I tend to assume that that's just sort of the default way things are. But that is not, that a, is fair not. Assumption. That is not a fair assumption. Live shows are also a totally valid thing to take priority in your mind if that's the way your mind is set up. I think it's probably most people are songs people. Right. Then then it's your live people. Then it's your album people. That's the way I've perceived it. But I could be completely wrong. But you're probably one of those three people. But if you're like me, you like all of those things. So it Definitely doesn't really matter. Definitely most people are songs people. Um, I don't know whether live or album has priority here. And I don't know if most metalheads are songs people. A lot of metalheads I mean, are songs people. Don't get me wrong. But 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 I don't know if most of my all, all of my bandmates are okay. You know, shrugs, free shrugs. So let, let's uh, discuss the parameters of this discussion today. So for the next few sh- uh, podcasts we're going to do that regard live shows, we're going to talk about sixteen different performances that touch pretty much every good metal subgenre. Yeah, we've got a power metal band, a couple of death metal bands, a couple of black metal bands, a couple of classic metal bands. I tried to avoid the legends as good as possible, but you know it's unavoidable because some of them are so good. Uh, you know, but you'll notice there's going to be less uh, super obscure bands that you've seen in some of our previous episodes. You know, we're going to be talking about Iron Maiden, we're going to be talking about Metallica because it's just unavoidable. And we tried to pick pro shoot concerts that are available on YouTube. There are definitely better examples out there. You just have to buy them on DVD or there's not a good rip of them on YouTube. And uh, when we post this video on YouTube, I will include in the comments a link to each of the live shows we're going to be discussing. Mm-hmm. All right. So I think we're going to spread out. If We're, we're, we're going to talk. We're going to do at least one live podcast probably with the same set of shows. Uh, at least one more, probably more than that. Yeah. But we're not necessarily going to do it the next podcast. I think next time around, oh, no. we're going to be Next doing, time we're going to try to do something different. I think we're going to be doing uh, a genre tier list, I think. Something like that. Yeah. So stick around. For Consider this. this part one in a series about live shows. Yes. And there will probably be more, uh, even more than that about live shows. But this is just what we're doing with a given set of live shows. Um, because Nick came up with an interesting way of organizing the different types of live shows. And I'm looking at this, and what I've noticed is, except for the last category, which is for guys on stage, which is kind of just when you do nothing, it's basically a spectrum of prepared, organized, high expenditure to spontaneity, and energy, and just people doing whatever. Uh, yeah, it's kind of a reliance on the energy of the performance versus the spectacle you can create around the performance. Mm-hmm. Whereas you're watching, are you watching the band? Are they you're, what you're watching? Or are you watching what's going on around the band? Yeah, yeah. So basically then the categories you've got You've got things on on the scale like intermediate levels, but basically, in, in the top you've got your you you've got you've got spectacle shows, rock shows, and punk shows, and then some other categories which are derived from them for the most part, right? Yes. Yeah. So your spectacle show is all the way in terms of like organized things, crazy stuff going on on stage, lots of props, lots of crazy lights. Your rock show is, well, your punk show is um, very stripped down. It's just what the band guys are doing. And it's just all their energy yes. and they're playing and all that kind of stuff. And the rock show is somewhere in between. Um, so, no, no, no. The spectacle shows are, a rock show is a spectacle show. So, the, the way I looked at it was metal bands don't have their own specific kind of live show. Okay. Some of them went the rock and roll route, which would be like what ACDC does or what Led Zeppelin or Pink Floyd would do. 
where they have their big spectacle. And then the punk show is like, it's supposed to be in a dodgy little dive bar. There's not a lot of crazy things on the, you know, the type of show Patrick would prefer. Yeah. I love them both, but I, I lean a, towards the spectacles. Uh, yeah. I mean, spectacles are all right, but I, I definitely have a preference towards the punky kind of shows. That is definitely, that's the environment I was raised in, so to speak. And I just always love that kind of ethos. I love, well, one of the things I love the most about like the punk type of show is just like how communal it is, how it just feels like these are the guys on the stage and everyone's together enjoying the same kind of thing. Uh, everyone's at a similar level and the energy is just an extremely high thing. Everyone's a participant. You know, everyone makes the show, not just the band. We don't, I don't just stand there watching, you know, I'm moshing. And I'm carrying the crowd surfers. And the crowd surfers are responding to the guy jumping up on the stage. And, you know, their mic passes off. In uh, in Power Trip, there were some moments where the mic passes off. That's a really cool moment, too. Um, yeah. Anyway, uh, <laughs> we actually want to talk about them last, I think. Because they're last yeah. on the list. Well, we're going we're gonna to do four guys on the stage last. Actually, let's, do let's do four guys, 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 guys on the stage first. Yeah, let's do four guys on the stage first. Yeah. Four guys on the stage is what it sounds like. So this sounds like a bad thing. Like four guys on a stage, that's boring. Uh, four guys I on the stage is, is – it's more or less the most risky attempt at a live show. And honestly, most local bands are four guys on a stage show. You know, they're either punk shows or four guys on a stage show. Yes. And you have to be really heavy to be a, a punk show in a local show. So Pretty much. four guys on the stage is the band members stand there and they play the music. There's not much going on behind them. There might be some lights. They might put some braziers on the stage, like Blind Guardian's case. Um, but the sh they're really relying hard on the music. And that's difficult to pull off well, because your music has to be really good, but you can't just rely on your songwriting. Because if you don't play well, you know, it sucks. Well, you know, the so, go on. So you had four examples here, right? Two good examples, which you gave as Blind Guardian and Ample, uh, Emperor. Ample. <laughs> Emperor. That's your favorite band. Uh, it's not my favorite band. However, they made my favorite metal album. So I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Voivod's your favorite band. Voivod is my favorite band. <laughs> you know that. Um, and then two bad examples as Mastodon and Carcass. And I noticed the difference between these is pretty simple. It, it's just that Mastodon and Carcass had bad sound. Yeah, so... They weren't playing poorly, I think Car they're just mixing was terrible. Carcass's problem, actually, I think, comes from... They're not very tight, but they, th that could have been passed if they had done better things with their gear. So Carcass's problem was they tune very, very low, and they weren't playing heavy enough strings, so it sounded very, very floppy. Oh, uh, yeah. Like... If you tune to B, which Carcass does, and they might have even tuned lower, you need to play with thicker strings so it can sound chunky. Because you're playing on a, a... You can fix it in production, but, you know, it just sounds pretty bad. Yeah, and also... And it, it really hurts me to say that, because I love Heartwork. It's one of my favorite albums. Yeah, and also the drums were too loud in the <laughs> mixing. Um, and, of course, they didn't do anything... They didn't do themselves any favors because they were just four guys on the stage, um, <laughs> which is just four guys on a stage. It's exactly what it sounds like. It's as it's as if you were playing the song in your house with with four other guys or whatever it is. Exactly. Um, but I didn't think they were any less tight than say Emperor because I actually noticed a couple of mis not so much in the playing. The guy who did backup vocals for Emperor was crap in Emperor's live. Show. Yes. Yes. He was all light spirit. <laughs> that's that's him. <laughs> so, which is so with, weird. With, uh, like, why are you, his job is to do keyboards and background vocals for Emperor? Emperor is a major band, and it is not difficult to do keyboards for Emperor. So, if this guy can't do half of his job, anyone could do the other half of his job, basically. 
So why is he there? <laughs> so one of the other things I want I want to delve into before we move on to the good examples is uh, Mastodon. Mastodon's a band I've grown up with. They're one of my first bands with Death Growling in it, so they hold a very special place in my heart. I came up during the Crack the Sky era, which was before they kind of became a post-metal band. But, you know, back again, they were still death metal at the time, or sludge metal, if you want to call it. But their performances have always been kind of disappointing. And they have a handful of problems. The first problem is Mastodon doesn't know how to build a set list. This particular show, they have a good opener. But sometimes they'll just open with a random song. And it'll just seem like songs are in weird places in their set list. And they have a song they tend to end with, Blood and Thunder, which is a fine track. But they have better tracks to end the show. But what really gets me about Mastodon is their vocal performance. Blood and Thunder album, would be a better opener than an ender. I agree. That's what they, they always end with Blood and Thunder, usually. However, let's 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 focus not on set list this time because we want to do that. Yes, yes, yes. We're, we're going to talk about set list later, but we're going to mention a couple of things about set lists here. We'll, we'll yeah. build on that in the future it's episode. Inevitable. So, Mastodon's issue is the vocals, by and large. You know, their their playing is a lot tighter than Carcasses. Their music's a lot more complicated than Carcasses, but that doesn't mean better. I think Carcass has some better songwriting than Mastodon. I think you'd agree. Uh, yeah. But, you know, they really need to do something about their vocals. Brent Hines is a, is interesting. Oh, man, I was laughing. <laughs> That's literally what the guy is. The line is... Split your lungs with blood and thunder when you see the white whale, and he'll go. This was impossible to know. This was the wild west. Well, that's, that's Troy. That's Troy. <laughs> oh man, that was funny. <laughs> yeah, but like their drummer Bron Daler is a phenomenal vocalist. Even live, he's very good. But he sings a minority of the music. <laughs> so. It's difficult with Mastodon. Um, yeah, I wasn't too invested in that band to begin with. The number one problem, it seemed to me, the reason it couldn't save it is just because their 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 audio quality was not good. It felt canned. I don't know how to describe it entirely. I, I think there was weight. It was way too heavy in the mids. I think, probably. Would you say? Um, I, I really like mids in the guitars. You know, I, I like a very mid-heavy guitar sound. You know, I, I te- on my amplifier, I tend to turn the mids up a little bit. But, you know, that's to cut through the mix. That's not to overwhelm the mix. Yeah, it felt like everything I think was in the, the mids. Yeah, so the bass needed to be pulled back. And, again, there's no saving their vocals. I love them dearly. And in the studio, they sound great. But there's no, st- there's no saving their vocals. Unless Bron Daler is singing. And he doesn't do any of the harsh vocals. We'll casually mention Blind Guardian. I think the only reason that Blind Guardian even falls into this category, I think they, they could have been more of a rock show, almost. But I think the thing is, it's just hilarious. Um, remind me his name, the vocalist of Blind Guardian. Hansi Kirsch, I yes. think. His stage presence is hilarious. Because what I expect from this guy, and the way he sings, is going to be like this all the time. But what he does is just... Like this, I am singing. And it's incredible. His voice is incredible, but like his stage performance is just like he's talking. He's just. <laughs> and in, in this it's particular performance, he has long scene. hair. Yeah, it's kind of surreal. But later, he cuts like, his hair. He looks like, like your dad when he cuts his hair. Like, there's more energy in the way I'm talking right now than in the way he sings. Yeah, he does, he's he's very effortless in his vocals, <laughs> which is hilarious because it sounds like there's a ton of effort going into his vocals. But it, it you look at him and no, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Blind Guardian in particular, I I think they really stick out to me in the four guys on a stage format because there's not a lot of energy coming from any members of the band. Yeah, you know the guitarists. You know, they they squat and you know they'll shred a little bit, especially the lead guitar player whose name I'm drawing a blank on. 
but what, what really saves them is their performance. Yeah, they really rock it. You know, I, I know we've gushed about Blind Guardian on this on the show before, but they fucking hold up. Yeah. And I I would not use that much of an expletive to for any other reason. They really are good, and their set list is strong too. Yeah, but Emperor, um, I don't know. You said it was good. I it it's definitely would be good in the sense that I could enjoy watching this. I could enjoy being at that show. But it's a lot less good than I would expect from Emperor. It's it's a lot. It's disappointing for what it could be, because they're they're a band that is so suited to theatrics. It's it's unreal, and it just would be so appropriate for them to come out there in night with like candles or braziers lit and cloaks and all that kind of stuff and you know fog machines, all that that stuff. The the kind of thing Mayhem do, but they don't. <laughs> He's just sitting there in his buttoned-up shirt and his sunglasses with his man bun. He's just like, yes. Also, his vocals were very disappointing. It turns out that the the I thought Aishan's vocals were really cool because they're in the studio, but they're totally a product of studio effects. They're not real, basically. Yeah, I, I've tried to tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, he's pretty medium. They're 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 fake. His real vocals are like a a mediocre metalcore scream, and something they do in the studio turns it into this crazy way up there thing. But it's not real. It's not real. <laughs> Sean's vocals are well, I, real. I think I think part of it is he he's aged. And oh yeah, they were his, better in the the show I sent you earlier. That's his screaming cool. style has deteriorated. I think. Yeah, his singing style has not deteriorated. No, his singing is, is great. And honestly, I really love that performance of Ino Asatana, which is my, my favorite Emperor track. And also, I would like to sh- point out that this particular version they're playing in the Night Side Eclipse, not in the Night Side, I'm sorry, uh, Anthems to Welcome at Dusk, all the way through, and they played The Wanderer. And I thought they did that phenomenally. How do you play The Wanderer phenomenally? I, I didn't get through the whole thing, I'm sorry, but... How do you play they, played the inst- they played the instrumental, and they did it really well. It was just a very good rendition of that track. It sounded perfect. Uh, okay, I mean, <laughs> The Wanderer was just never something I would write home to Mob about in the first place. It's nice to have there, but like, okay, I, I'll, 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 I'll have to take a look. I don't know what it was. I just really think that version of The Wanderer is my favorite. I'll have to take a favorite look. Version. But on the upside, their playing was tight, except for the one vocalist. And um, it was very audible, and so you got the experience of listening to it. But also, Emperor the, should never play in daytime ever. Every video I found of Emperor playing live is always in the day. It's it's terrible. I was trying to find a <laughs> night show that was recent, and I couldn't. <laughs> like what's wrong with you? You had one job. Of of every band I could possibly think of. It's hard to think of one more that is worse suited to uh, daytime than Emperor. Mayhem. Maybe Mayhem, but at least Mayhem have the chaotic thing and you could, you know... I feel like if I heard Death Crush, I could just start a pit, you know? And it's, ooh, it's a party of violence and all that kind of stuff. At least. I guess. So... Emperor's a very contemplative band. Yes, you exactly. Know? Exactly. So... Even May- Mayhem, definitely also a band I would rather see in nighttime. I would probably However, if, 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 I had to pick a, if I had to pick an Emperor album to see in the day, it would be Anthems, Anthems to the Welcome at Dusk is yeah. better than In the Nightside Eclipse. Uh, yeah. Because there, there's a version of In, in the Nightside Eclipse that is the same eclipse. thing. Eclipse. <laughs> yeah. Keyword night. <laughs> Keyword eclipse. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It doesn't really work. <laughs> Literally the entire thing of their first album, which is their best album, contrary to Nick opinion, <laughs> is I, I do prefer anthems a little bit more, but Inoa Satana is their best track. Uh but anyways, yes. It's called In the Night Side Eclipse. The whole painting is basically just Van Gogh's Starry Night updated and made more metal into Mordor. Um Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just I am the Black Wizards. <laughs> it's stars, dark forests, night sky. That's the whole thing. <laughs> okay, so, so we should book them for two p.m. Then. 
quite a festival, you know. <laughs> you gotta, you can't really take that into consideration. Well, then they sh- okay, okay, uh, yes, that's true. So I wouldn't want to see them at a festival. I guess that's the only way you're gonna see them. You know, why do they only play festivals so that they can only play in daytime? And they come out in sunglasses and a man bun and go play Inua Satana. <laughs> I don't think they like touring. I think they just like playing shows here and there to stay relevant. Okay. Well, let's move on from four guys on stage. <laughs> so let's go. So the, the next thing you can do if you want to up your game as far as a live show is the punk show. You take your four guys on a stage, you play in a small venue. And you just go as crazy as you possibly can. Oh, yeah. You bring that energy, and you, f- more importantly, try and make the crowd go with you. Oh, yeah, that's uh, how you do it. <laughs> this, one, this one's hard to do, because if your music isn't heavy enough, it's going to fall flat. If your music isn't good enough, it's not going to you know, be as good. You know? So the, the examples I gave for the punk show... Would, were uh, Power Trip, Metallica, and Zabalba. So I, I tried to go the span of a punk show at a stadium, which would be Metallica, and this is the 1989 version of Metallica, not the new We Play the Outlaw Torn version of Metallica. Yeah. Uh, Power Trip, which is playing at a relatively large venue in New York City, I believe, and I had the option to go to this show, but Power Trip wasn't headlining. Uh, I think High on Fire was. And I'll go see Power Trip, but I want to see an. I'm not paying 25 bucks to see Power Trip pay, so, play eight songs and then have to sit through High on Fire. No, if it were the other way around, hell yeah, I'm going. But either way, I feel um, like High on Fire would only have like what 12 tracks anyway. Yeah, but the tr- tracks are how long? Was there anyone before Power Trip? I don't recall. I don't. I don't know. Okay. Yeah. But anyway, the next one would be. Uh, Zibalba, which is uh, where, where they're from. They're, they're some sort of Spanish, right? I think they're California, right? You're talking about hardcore Zibalba, right? They, yeah, they, they speak Spanish, though, one of some of their songs. Yes, I think they're from California, South California. Oh, really? I thought they're from South America. Uh, I don't think so. That's fascinating. <laughs> yeah. I mean, South California, there's, there's a lot of Hispanic people, Spanish speaking people. In South California, and I'm pretty sure that that's what Zabalba is. They've, they've got that going on. Well, either way, Zabalba puts on a really fun show, and you know they, they've they've played in venues that I've played at, so it's it's really cool to to see a show like that. And let me tell you, they blow you away. And their music is really heavy. It's like kind of on the border of like hardcore death metal and beatdown. Yeah. So it it really gets you. Oh yeah. It's, I mean, Zabalba is like one of the major classic, yeah, they're from Pomona, California. Yeah, Zabalba is one of the major, I mean, so much of what's called hardcore is some or other form of metal, basically, (laughs) and Zabalba is a hardcore staple, and so is Power Trip, and both of them are metal bands, (laughs) but um, a lot of what's called hardcore is, is metal nowadays. A lot of what's in the hardcore scene is called metal nowadays. But one of the things that distinguishes it is this sort of ethos, this kind of punk show um, that has a lot of trademarks, lots of stage diving. Um, you know, ideally, if you're going to have a punk show, I mean, I'm not, I don't think Metallica can still do this kind of thing for obvious reasons. But ideally, Not anymore, but they could in 89. Yes. Ideally, you want to you want to have people jumping on and off your stage constantly. You want to, um, here's the mic, here's the mic, pass off, pass it off. Um, you want to, um, I think John Keevil in some early shows has like jumped into the mosh pit and started headbanging and then jumped back up. <laughs> you, you want, you know what you want? Warbringer do a punk show, um, still. Um, and you want, yeah. you want, um, Eight guys in um, the middle of dingbats, they start rowing, and you just <laughs> row to the vanquished? Audience participation, man. <laughs> yeah, audience participation is, is the, the, the key factor of the punk show. And these shows actually are probably the most fun. Yeah. But there's the least amount of musical appreciation. You know? 
I like mean, you don't have to play really tightly. You just have to go crazy. Yeah. Well, yes, it's the least amount of musical appreciation required. But there's Power Trip. We're playing tight. You know. Well, yeah. Power Trip is an excellent band, and they are a staple in modern metal. Yeah. It's you know, like, Power Trip um, was a B list for me. Power Trip was like B, B tier for for me until I saw this live show yesterday, and I was like, oh, okay. I see. This isn't a thrash band that is taking some influence from hardcore. This is just a hardcore band doing the thrash parts of hardcore songs all the time. Yeah. So <laughs> this is a, a big thing that I, I wanted to address. So I'm going to go on a little tangent here, but I think this is the general message of the whole video. You know, you fo when you focus on the studio album all the time, you miss out on something. And I, I've found that bands I've seen live and had never really given a passing glance to, can occasionally swing me to like them. My favorite examples are Anthrax and Meshuga. I never thought I'd be a huge Anthrax fan. Like, they have a handful of, like, good hits. I was like, yeah, Anthrax is a songs band. I can jam to Cotton and Mosh every now and again. Fight them till you can't, it's a great track. But then I saw them live. Damn. Mm. Damn. Okay. And, you know, Power Trip is probably going to be a similar thing for you because some bands are just better live than in the studio. Yeah, you're better live. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> um, but yeah, Power Trip. Punk shows. That's the environment I was growing up with. That's uh, what I did in Mishap. It's not what I did in Necroergica overall, but I felt like a fish out of water in Necroergica kind of for that reason. Like, what do I do? This is not... <laughs> audience participation i have to put on a spectacle what do i do <laughs> i have to pretend that i'm somehow removed from the audience when really it's just you know <laughs> your better life says metal pure liquid that's what i said um, <laughs> um but it's, it's it's weird for me to go past that level because there's nothing there's no pretense in a punk show you're literally just the guy that's on stage right now, you know? <laughs> yeah. But you're an audience member that's that happens to be playing the music and leaving the rest of the audience. For the you don't have to wear a costume either, you know? You yeah. can just look like a hobo. Oh, yeah. It's better to look like and a hobo. And then do. <laughs> so it, it's, it's a little difficult for me to try to get out of that environment. You know, one of the cool things about um, Mayhem earlier on i think was they had elements of the punk show with like spectacle put together in a lot of ways um yeah because they did crazy stuff but they did crazy stuff to the audience <laughs> so that's yeah <laughs> that would be and that's different, different from the next category which is the spectacle punk show yeah. but anyway um let's but before do you oh, want to no. move on or you want to say more things uh i don't really have anything else to say um, did you have okay. something else to say about the punk show type thing? Um, and, uh, I'll just end with this. If, if you're in a band and you're looking to get going, my advice is play your heaviest songs live and try and get this type of vibe because this is what will make people think you're a significantly better band than you are. I mean, that's you definitely know, I, one way to do it. But I feel like in Mindraiser, you guys actually pull something off that is not very punky at all. But, like, you manage to have a spectacle without a budget. Just by... There's a lot of synchronization in Mind, Mind Razor. You know what I'm saying? I wasn't trying to talk about Mind Razor, but sure. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, we're talking about what kind of approach you can have as a live band on a low scale. And... Yeah. What you're doing... Um, punk is the easiest way to make it better than just four guys on the stage. But you yes. can have the spectacle of sort of you know, coming together, playing your instrument on the, the, the drum, playing your instrument two guys next to each other, dueling guitars, headbanging all at the same time, one guy's up on his uh, his amplifier when he plays the intro, that kind of stuff. And then, of course, Weissman's faces at all times. You know, that's not exactly, <laughs> that's not exactly punk. That's more of a spectacle or a rock thing, but without the budget, without the required budget. It's all in the synchronized, you know, sort of, I mean, it's it's yeah. the, really, for lack of a better term, it's choreographed, you know? 
<laughs> but we, we definitely have tried that. You know, I, I will I will admit to doing some choreography with the band. Yeah, uh, that so- was actually that was uh, our our you know our our lead guitar player Mo's doing actually. He was the the one oh, who, yeah. who led the charge on that. Yeah, that makes sense. He's he's totally got the vibe. He's Mo has such a vibe. <laughs> so. Speaking of spectacles and punk show, yes. the spectacle punk show. Yeah. So the spectacle punk show is a, a pretty wide net. I think this is any punk band that kind of makes it out of the the underground and tries to do something a little bit bigger than themselves. My my favorite example of this is Slipknot because Slipknot they're obviously like a huge spectacle, but they're trying really hard to play the punk show. Yeah. You know, and they got this, this, the DJ guy, and he's jumping off of things. Yeah. And they got the, the new guy who replaced the nose guy, and he's doing the worm. So, you know? Yes, so let me, let me uh, mention for a second, you know, three episodes ago, I was saying, you know, why did anyone ever hate Slipknot? He must have just been the fan base, because their music's great. And then I saw them live, and I actually enjoyed it. I didn't not enjoy it don't get me wrong but at the same time i started to understand why people don't like this band <laughs> again besides oh, really why base. because there's like four or five guys they don't need on stage <laughs> doing stupid things like a clown just comes up and hits a, a trash can with a metal bat and that's stupid <laughs> It's a beer keg, sir. Yeah, he just hits it with a metal bat every now and again. <laughs> you, you look at that. You got to go, What? what is going on here? This is just stupid. <laughs> um, and also, it's it's so down-tuned like Carcass. I feel like that kind of down-tuned sound often works. It sounds better in the studio than live, period. Yes. And if you if you tune down too low, it can really get very muddy. But I did enjoy it overall because I enjoyed um, having I enjoy the idea of a spectacle punk show. They did have the energy there, and they I, I'm not opposed to the idea they have these masks. Um, it does feel a little bit like one person could do all the relevant things that the weird all the different weird people are doing. Like you could have one person do DJ turntables and electronics. And the trash cans, and musically, you would be able to do all of those things. And musically- it really should just be the clown guy. <laughs> yeah, it really should. But they've got a bunch of other guys on stage. Just like, you know, you can include them if you want. They're your friends, and they have interesting masks and an interesting presence. But it's not required musically, and it's very easy to forget that there are that many people in the band when you're here in the studio. <laughs> Yeah, I'm. I mean, <laughs> no band needs nine members, but good on them for having it. You know, a uh, symphonic band might, or like a jazz, or something like that. Yeah, but but so not the, doesn't. <laughs> so I, I think Slipknot is is definitely closer on the spectacle side, but you know they they do a couple of interesting things, particularly if you've ever watched a Slipknot show or seen it, you know, they, they are very encouraging of mosh pits. And they're, they're very particular about the, uh, the jump and spit it out. Jump you know? The fuck up. <laughs> you know, they, they, Corey does that silly thing where everyone gets on the floor and, uh, you know, I'm going to be honest, I've seen Slipknot live. I saw Slipknot live in an amphitheater mm-hmm. of all places. So everyone was in seats and it wasn't as cool as if it were in open air. But having to get down and jumping up, let me tell you, it feels it feels cool, man. It's just like a crazy feeling. And it doesn't translate well in the video. Mm. But, you know, it's cool. Yeah. Yeah, it really sucks when um, the venue is incorrect for the type of show that is being played. You know? Yes. And that's always going to be the case for a new Metallica show, I think, for one thing. (laughs) Because Metallica... They're fine on a football field. Okay. Yeah, well, I don't know. I've never seen them. Um, But I've only ever seen Metallica on the floor. I've never seen Metallica in seats. Yeah. 
and I had I I think Metallica might have been the most fun I've ever had at a concert. And I'm not a huge Metallica fan. I'm a significantly bigger Megadeth fan. Interesting. Well, uh, I, I, Metallica's great. They're fun. Code Orange, I saw live. Um, let me be straight with you guys. I'm not a huge fan of Code Orange. Um, I think they do put on a great uh, live show. They're a lot better live, actually, um, because I don't think their studio production is any good at all, for starters. Um, but Code Orange have one of the most violent shows, if not the most violent show I've ever seen, in terms of just like the intensity of the mosh pit. And that is encouraged by, they, they have a lot of lights going on, um, and I think they do some weird stuff, but for the most part, it is basically on the punk side. It's just that they're getting big enough that it's, it's not a proper punk show anymore. It's just like, how big can you take it before it's not a punk show anymore, you know? Well, yeah, they, they, they're starting to have visuals, like in this particular version, and this particular show that we've chosen was is the most recent show on the list. It happened at the very beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. Oh. They were playing in an open venue in Pittsburgh. No one was there. It was just Code Orange. <laughs> and it was insane. They had crazy visuals. You know, the drummer was wearing some kind of mask to, to obscure his face. The, the mic stand for the, the former drummer, now vocalist, is an arm, but it's a mechanical arm. There's like some crazy animation going on behind them. They've got the lion in chrome on all the amplifiers, which, to be honest with you, they're playing EVH 5153 EL34 amps. They're perfectly visible. And have you ever seen one of those amps? They're black and gold. Everything on the stage is chrome, and they've got these g ugly gold amps in the back. Kind of weird, but Everything they're a great sounding amp. So I, I didn't, I didn't. I didn't see this. Reason being, I you know had limited time this week, and I had to prioritize uh, stuff I haven't seen before. I've seen Code Orange live before, um, and I haven't. By the way, I love this band, and I haven't seen them live. And this bastard has. Yeah, I have. I had a second chance to see them live, and I missed it. Um, like I was at a show that Code Orange was was uh, playing, and we left before Code Orange came on. <laughs> Because <laughs> I'm not that into Code Orange. <laughs> um, I hate to break it to you. But, you know, respect. Um, respect to the extreme level of violence that ensues whenever um, whenever a show starts. You know, normal stuff. It's a mosh pit. It's not like people get like actually belligerent. It's just that the moshing is so intense that people have to leave. In <laughs> <laughs> they're 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 nuts their shows are insane yeah dude <laughs> and uh you know all of them are just as insane you know uh the chick who does vocals she's insane yeah uh the the, the, the front man slash former drummer now that he's off the drums and in front of the mic I mean, he, he's nuts i think it was the bassist. You know, they're, they're all great i think it was the bassist and i don't know what it was about him but he just looked so huge and intimidating. One of the guys, he is large. Yeah, he was. He, he is large. Looks huge, and especially when he's next to the, to the girl who's on vocals. I I don't know any of their names, but like, <laughs> like he looks huge. He looks like the last person I would want to meet in an alley. <laughs> so my, my my favorite thing is you're watching this video and you see this chick. And you're like, that's the most badass girl I've ever seen. You know, she's got her hair covering her face. She's got this guitar that looks like a rock, <laughs> and you know she's 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 not a huge girl, but she looks like she's a little like if you ran into this girl in an alley, you you know oh, this girl's gonna beat the shit out of me. Then you see this guy walk up to her, and he towers over her, and you're like, oh, never mind. I'm afraid of that guy. <laughs> I'm afraid of that guy. <laughs> yeah, which is saying something. And then all the energy is coming from the back with the drummer because he's doing vocals while playing. Uh, vocal Not anymore. Drums. He's oh. the front man now. Oh, okay. Well, he used to be. He used to be doing vocals yeah. while playing drums. And I was like, is this man on cocaine? <laughs> because he had so much energy. Um, and he was so angry. Um, but yeah, that's, that's Code Orange and Slipknot in the Spectacle Punk Show category. So the next category would be your general rock show. Um, and 
it's it's kind of silly that I put rock show and then I chose two death metal bands to represent them. But your rock show is when you think concert, it's this. It's the band is going to play. There's going to be lights. If there is a screen, it's just what the band is doing or maybe some abstract imagery. And, you know, maybe there'll be a fog machine. But again, the focus is the band, and then there's, you know, again, some abstract visual. But the band isn't interacting with anything. Like, there's no costumes. You know, there's no weapons being thrown around. It's not Alice Cooper level yet. Right. And the bands I chose were Meshuga and Gojira, which are both technical death metal bands. So I chose them for different reasons. Meshuga wise, absolutely nuts light show. Um, Best light show I've ever seen. Basically, it's a it's a it's a rave of absolute destruction and chaos. <laughs> like it's basically a rave. It really is, but it's just just a rave of moshing. However, I gotta say, uh, the live sound on that Meshuga video was pretty terrible. Well, once again, Meshuga t- plays eight string guitars, so it's su- so I, I think the moral of the story is reconsider tuning super low. Yeah. It's going to sound amazing in the studio, but live it's going to suck. Yeah. Now, Meshuga is one of the bands that I saw live, never thought I'd like them, and now I'm in love with them. And they opened with a track they played in the show. They opened with Clockworks the first time I saw them, which is just the most amazing light performance I've ever seen. So if you want to see a great song with crazy lights, look no further than Meshuga playing Clockworks off their new album. It's outstanding. It'll blow you away. And it blew me away. The the most intimidating thing about Mashuga though, it's these large Swedish men, and they just kind of stand in a line yeah, on the front of the much. stage. Yeah. And like- it is they are com- they're completely obscured. They're just silhouettes. And the lights are just going insane. <laughs> yeah. And you're gonna get epilepsy watching them. But it's just so intimidating and so cool. It's just it's got this air of, e- of evil and like if you're familiar with D and D, there's this the the mind flayer, which my band is is affectionately named after. This is what you hear and what you see when the mind flayer is drilling into your head and sucking out your brain. That's what a Mashuga show is. And on a similar note, dude, Gojira was the weirdest experience to watch the live video of, right? Because the way it starts out, <laughs> I'm looking at the the stage. And I'm looking at the audience and what they're doing, and I'm like, what is this hippie shit? <laughs> this is the most yeah. summer of love looking concert I've ever seen. There's like tie-dye and peace signs on the stage, and it's like sunset, and there's some ch- chick like standing on top of a guy's shoulders, and the guy has dreads, and they're tossing beach balls around, and like sharks and that kind of stuff, and it's sunset, and they're going, Wee! And then, um, and then the music starts. And if I were just looking at the video of the music, I would think this is Alter Bridge. But the sound that is coming out is like an alien death ray. <laughs> and then people in the background, the hippies just start moshing to the alien death ray that is being performed by Alter Bridge. <laughs> They do look like Alter Bridge. That's, that's, they, 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 that's the description of that's my description of a Gojira show. The hippies just start moshing to the alien Alter to the alien death ray produced by Alter Bridge. That is what Gojira sounds looks like. So, w- with Gojira, you have to understand they are an environmentalist band. Yes, they're very like avid activists for environmentalism. So that attracts that weird crowd. But the one weird thing to look at with Gojira is their bass player, whose name I can never remember. Is he the one that actually looks like a metalhead? No, he's the one that looks the least like a metalhead. The bass player is the guy who is... He looks like he should be at a punk show doing punk things, but looks like a preppy French guy. Right. He's the least metal-looking guy on the stage. But he's just going nuts, and it's insane. He's jumping off of stuff. Yeah. Dancing around like a lunatic. It's really, it's and, really and, the front man who who looks like he should be an altar bridge. <laughs> he does. He does. <laughs> Joe Duplantier looks like he belongs in altar bridge. However, he is a great death metal front man. Believe it or not, 
Yeah, no, it sounds I'm, it's not even a criticism. It's just weird to see someone yeah. who looks so like, you know, high budget rock. <laughs> playing a telecaster, by the way. Playing a track, not exactly. playing. Right. And what he's producing is alien invasion noises. <laughs> and uh I think Gojira is the best example of a great performance apart from one band. You know, they're they're so, so tight. Yeah. The drummer is spectacular. He's just an, uh, Mario Duplantier is one of the greatest drummers in live show metal right now. Just for his sheer level of tightness. They're not doing anything like ridiculous. Or not. He's not doing gravity blast. You know, he's not going at 6000 BPM with double bass. You know, he's he's not Nile. <laughs> but damn, is that guy tight? Yeah. But I should Oh, what was this thing? oh yeah, I, I just wanted to add, it was also really crazy to hear his vocals being performed live because they feel so, like, uh, technically produced, like they're heavily affected or something like that. It's just not a sound I would expect from a real person to come out in, like, an unprocessed way. Um, but it did. <laughs> you know, exactly yeah. the kind of vocal sound I heard on the studio is what came out of his mouth. And that's just crazy to see because that's just a vocal style that seems like it would be hard to achieve in real life. So kind of the opposite of what Emperor had going. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think if Emperor were a little bigger, they could definitely pull off a very similar show to Gojira. Right, but if they- Ishan had a little more time to practice his vocals. Yeah, but, but he, he shouldn't. He should be doing a show like I know. Mayhem. That's what he should be doing. <laughs> yes, I, I think so too. So do we want to move on to the next uh, type of show? Yeah, which includes Mayhem, conveniently enough. Yes, so, so conveniently Mayhem is the in the next category, which is the small-scale spectacle show. This is, a ban- this is for bands that aren't big enough to do the big stadium shows but are good enough and well-liked enough to put on a spectacle. These bands, for some reason, aren't ever going to break into stadiums, probably because they're extreme metal. Well, they also have to have, like, a strong enough concept to do it. It's not just a matter of... Yes. Because, like, if a band like Power Trip, for instance, tried to put on a spectacle show, what would be there? (laughs) Nothing. Exactly. Like, what can you do? They're not... not, What what does Power Trip sing about? What does Power Trip? What is their music about? Their their music is about either like personal issues and working through them, or it's about generalized violence, or it's about social criticism. And mostly, it's about social criticism. And what spectacle? You can't put a spectacle on out. You know what the spectacle of that is? It's people moshing. That's what the spectacle of that is. (laughs) So as as good as Power Trip is, and how they're really blowing up, and if and if Power Trip's next album is good. They will blow. They're going to be like now. Okay, Power Trip is god tier legend metal. I, I think that's going to be the case. They're going to be as big as bands like Gojira if their next album is as good as Nightmare Logic or better. Yeah, but there's just but, no spectacle um, to put there. There's just yeah, it's, exactly. It's just inappropriate. You have to have. It'll just be a light show. You have to have concepts. Basically, you have to be sort of a concept band. You have to have visuals that can associate with your music for it to work. You know, yes, and this is why Amana Marth and Mayhem are so perfect examples of this type of thing. Because Amana Marth, it's every song is about Vikings. We're just gonna sing about Vikings, and it's gonna be fun. And we're gonna be the ACDC of death metal. We pl- every song sounds like it's the same thing. Every song could be on every single album they've done, and. There's going to be some guys with swords, and they're going to fight, and there's going to be a big Viking head on the stage, <laughs> yep. and there's going to be fire, and the singer looks like a Viking, and he's got a, a giant mule mirror, and he's going to beat the stage hand with it. And that's what they're going to do. <laughs> that's a monomarth. Yes. And then people will row. <laughs> Yes, and the best thing to ever come out of a Monomarth was the rowing pits. <laughs> they got this track, Pursuit of the Vikings. It's got a nice groove to it. It's medium pace. Everyone gets on their ass. 
and starts rowing. <laughs> that is their contribution to metal. That is the Modern Arts contribution to metal. And we have they invented. Taken, we have taken to rowing in every show. That uh, <laughs> yeah, I just do it at every show now. <laughs> if, if it's a show, we're doing it. And so hopefully that'll eventually just snowball into a thing people do at metal shows in general. <laughs> well, I think it really is. It's kind of becoming a thing at more than just a modern Marth shows. Yeah, it's just, but, I mean, some parts are not appropriate for moshing, but you want to do something, fucking row. <laughs> just go ahead. <laughs> I, can't, I can't wait to go to an Iron Maiden show where they play the Talisman. So I can just get on my ass and start like, West, we're the for nine minutes. Oh, man. Nine minutes of rowing. That is so appropriate. That is so appropriate. I want to want to start rowing at, like, a Voivod song. Like, row to killing technology. Killing technology. <laughs> that, that won't work. I know. That's why I want to do it. <laughs> okay. So, um, the thing about these bands is... You know, they're 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 not like going to have as excellent music as Emperor, but um, they could. They are Emperor their songs are band. good. Yes, they could be, but most of the time these bands are a little larger because they have something going on that makes people come to them. You know, again, the best bands don't always make it to the the top tier. You know, I love Mayhem. I'm I'm a bigger Mayhem fan than I am an Emperor fan. We have to acknowledge here, Mayhem does not have as strong music as Emperor does. Mayhem just has more fun music, and they've also got the crazy notoriety behind them. Okay. But these bands, they have the combination of they have their little gimmick, which for Mayhem, it's, hey, all of our band members are evil and murdered each other and burned churches down, and they made a movie about us. <laughs> that's, that's, Mayhem's, that's Mayhem's appeal. We've got good music, and that happened. Now we're going to put on this insane spectacle after 20 years of playing garbage live shows, and it's going to be awesome. Yes. The Monom Arth's thing is, we look like Vikings. We sing about Vikings. Come to our show. We have Ren Fair actors fighting on our stage with swords. You can row. <laughs> yes. And you know what? All of our songs are fast and melodic, so you can get as drunk as you want and sing, and everyone loves it. Oh, and we usually use a lot of fire. However, in the show I picked, they didn't have fire, because it's the only good live performance I could find. But it didn't have fire. We didn't talk specifically about what goes into Mayhem shows. Um... Basically, the both both the shows I saw, I didn't watch Mayhem because I've seen Mayhem twice. Uh, I didn't. And watch, it, uh, it was the same movie. tour. Oh, it was the same tour. Okay, so there you go. But they go on. They've got their hoods. They've got their insane amount of fog. They've got a few like props of like demons and things in the background, and they're just basically most for the most most everyone is playing just hooded. They're just hooded vague figures like the ghouls and ghosts or whatever shrouded by a bunch of mist it's dark the lights are weird um and then you've got attila and attila attila got a a weird presence attila's just just unnerving because he, attila is inhuman he's a zombie he's a snake he slithers around like a snake that's what he looks like he's he's like a zombie he's snake. not a He's not a small guy either. Like he's actually kind of a burly character. Like he's got a closer build to you or I than he would a really lanky guy. He doesn't look like he he would sound, you know. But he's just crouching and I am Attila. And he sings like that. And he like contemplates he is, his skull. And there's candles. And <laughs> it looks like he's covered in blood or something like that. It's it's never possible to like see Attila properly at a mayhem show, like no, like you can't really make out what he looks like for whatever reason. He, he's, he's just coated in makeup and blood, yeah. and he he like puts liquid latex on his face so it looks like his face is being ripped off. And he's always sort of hiding himself too, so you never get a clear look at him. He's always just like, just... and and so it's and he, like. The whole time, you can just sit there trying to figure out wh what Attila looks like. <laughs> and that's an interesting enough experience on itself compared to the music. And when they're not playing the Mysterious Dom Satanus songs, which is really interesting, if you look at some of their shows where they play a more diverse set list, mm -hmm. they only do the robes for the Mysterious Dom Satanus. Hmm. Like, they'll, they'll take a period of their show in the middle 
where they'll play Funeral Fog, Freezing Moon, Pagan Fears, and the title track. Mm-hmm. And they'll wear the robes. And then they'll take it all off and play Death Crush. And they'll all be shirtless. That's kind of appropriate, to be honest with and you. And with, with, with Attila, even when he's not dressed in his silly robes and stuff like that, he'll be wearing some sort of you know Nazi shirt. Whatever, like it'll have like one of one of their war, old German war shirts, but he'll have blood covered on his face, and he won't be able to make out what he looks like anyway. Huh. Yeah, he, he you could just never make out what he looks like because he just distorts his body so much, and he's got painting on his face. Like he'll have like weird glyphs and shit, and it's I still just don't nuts. know what Attila looks like. I think I saw an yeah. interview with him once, but I forgot what he looks like, and. And now I've only seen him live enough, so I still don't know what the guy looks like, really. <laughs> yeah, he's just an odd character, and he is got one of the most unique stage presences in the world, and he's just a delight to watch. Really, he he is he he is what makes me love mayhem. I actually prefer new, seeing mayhem live now than I would if they had Euronymous and 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 dead because like he's just such an interesting character his vocals are unique and his presence is unique there will never be another vocalist like attila i mean dead also had a unique presence so i'd like to see dead again um i think you'd probably listen if someone said you can see mayhem with dead or mayhem with attila right now surely you would say dead because you've seen mayhem with attila so at least you gotta you gotta want to see dead (laughs) <laughs> well, the thing about Dead is, you know, Dead's actually mutilating himself yes, on stage. Yes, Dead is actually mutilating himself on stage, and he's throwing pigs' heads into the crowds and stuff like that. Well, you know, I believe Attila did that, too. Did he? Just at different, different shows. Huh. Interesting. Well. I'm sure it's happened. Yes. So, that could be, it could be fun. Yeah, uh. All in all, if you're going to see a black metal band and you've got a little extra money to burn, go see Mayhem. They're always touring. Yeah. They're always around. And they're really and, good. And I was surprised the first time. I thought they were not going to be good. They were really good. Yeah, you know, I've seen older live videos, uh, especially in the Maniac years, like after, like post Grand Declaration of War, like Chimera era. Mm-hmm. And uh, the live show is pretty terrible. You know, they weren't very tight. Uh, but you know these new guitar players they've got, Telok and Ghoul, they really brought the band together. The band sounds really good, and uh, you know they're they're on the up and up. May- Mayhem just keeps getting better at this point. All right, now last category we got our the first top rock show. So this is my favorite category. This is. Probably the the creme de la creme of live shows. You know, this is performance is tight, songs are good, and there is just every song something new and interesting happens. There's some sort of new visual, and it's equally crazy. So the bands we picked here are are going to be pretty obvious: Rammstein, Ghost, and Iron Maiden. If you want to see a show, these three bands are the bands to see. Yeah. They're expensive, but they're worth it. Gee, I wonder why they're expensive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, actually, uh, Iron Maiden tickets are cheaper than Metallica tickets. So are Rammstein tickets. Yeah. Ghost tickets aren't that expensive at all. Yeah, that's because Metallica commit highway robbery on a regular basis. Fair. <laughs> So <laughs> let, let's start from, you know, chronologically, let's start with Ghost. So the performance I picked was Ghost at Hellfest in, in uh, well, 2016. And how uh, is Ghost chronological? Oh, it's chronological in terms of the order of the... Yeah, we're, we're, we're going, you know, youngest band to oldest band. Oh, right. Well, then, okay, yeah. That's I just want to do Iron Maiden last. I want to do Iron Maiden last, too, but I was just going to go in priority. In, I, if it were me, I would have just gone in order of how good they are and started with Rammstein. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we can talk about Rammstein. <laughs> because the thing about Rammstein is um, I don't like them in the studio, um, but I think I would probably enjoy seeing them live um, from what I saw because that is pretty crazy, I must admit. 
they they put a lot of effort into that. <laughs> how much how much of it did you watch? Uh, about four songs. Did you watch the last one? I did not watch the last one. Go watch the last one. I'll have to watch the last one for next time. You have to watch the last song. But I don't, um, so, I don't like Rammstein in the studio, period. It's just I, – I, so, like I still kind of don't again, like it live because the music's not that, that great live. However, they're doing some crazy stuff. So uh, as far as the spectacle goes, I'm pretty sure Rammstein is unrivaled. Even Iron Maiden – doesn't do as crazy things as Rammstein does. And the show I gave you was a festival show. It wasn't their full-fledged live show. Okay, their full-fledged yeah. live show is crazier. In their full-fledged live show right now, they have a second stage. They put the second stage in the middle of the crowd. And the middle of the, sh- at the towards the end of the show... They will somehow appear in the middle of the crowd. But how do they get back, you might ask? Boats. <laughs> boats. Do the boats... And the they... crowd... Crowd surfs <laughs> these boats <laughs> after the stage. I was going to say, <laughs> is there like a mechanical arm? No, they're crowd surfs. No, it's the crowd. The crowd has to take the boats band back. <laughs> <in> <laughs> the <laughs> they gotta start rowing. <laughs> but it doesn't stop there. It doesn't stop there. No, they've got a song called Pussy. Yes. And Pussy is a very demented song about exactly what it sounds like. They pretend it's in German, but it's in English. Uh, and what does the singer do in Pussy, you might ask? Oh, nothing. He just rides a giant phallus that shoots foam. Yeah, let's just bring a giant phallus out and parade it around and have the singer ride on it. Yeah, that's what we're going to do. I see. You know, and, and, you know, they'll do one track, Mine Pile, where they put the keyboard player in a giant pot and light him on fire. Nice. Let's light each other on fire. That's Rammstein's thing. Also, you know, according to Slava Zizek, they actually uh, subvert authoritarianism by allowing us to appropriate the fascist gesture. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, they def- actually does well, claim that. <laughs> Rammstein has an interesting relationship with fascism because they're, they're one of those German groups that are, are not necessarily like, we're so sorry for the Nazis. No, they, they acknowledge that that was a part of German history. You know, and they they do so in a in a very international way, and sometimes they they use their imagery as a way of, you know, I I can't think of the right way to say it, but it's not in a, a racist way or a we're Nazis way. It's in a, you know, sodomize the Nazis way. Well, they're a shock rock band, so for sure, and and they also have an interesting background as coming from communist germany hmm. you know they they I, I don't think they are communists i think they were actually probably subversives if i had to guess mm-hmm. so you know they, they have a very interest i think that's where all the industrial elements come from you know we we grew up in communist germany and you know this is kind of our way of making fun of the whole factory lifestyle and whatnot but uh, again it their music isn't for everybody. I enjoy it because I, I listened to it when I was a kid and I thought it was fun. But again, they're one of those bands that you see a live video and then you know one of their silly little hooks gets stuck in your head. You're like, okay, I can dig Rammstein. Yeah, nine. <laughs> Rammstein. Yeah, yeah nine. They, and, and that particular <laughs> song nine. is just amalgamations of, of Rammstein song titles. So it's literally yes, no. Name of band, <laughs> and the that lyrics is their, are all their song titles. That, that's their overture. <laughs> oh man, that's how you do it. That track isn't even on an album, by the way. <laughs> you guys, <laughs> that's funny. You guys got to do a Mind Razor version of that. <laughs> of Rom Four, <laughs> where you just start singing your song titles. <laughs> you, you know they have four songs that are are about their title. There's Rammstein, Ram 4, Rom Lead. I think there's one more. I can't remember what it is. But they've got a bunch of songs that are like, uh, you know, just references to their name. 
What does Rammstein mean? It's a place. Oh, okay. I think there place? was like there there was something historical that happened there, either like a murder or like a, a plane crash or something. Something bad happened there. It's like a tragedy. Metal Gear Liquid said, "Do host," which is a Rammstein. Do host. That is the most popular Rammstein no. song, I think. That song is a guilty pleasure for me. I love that song. It's so much fun. It's so overplayed, but like, I don't care. <laughs> that song's fun. I don't like Rob I just <laughs> <laughs> so Let's discuss the the, ne- the next band yeah. on the list because I think we've we've drilled in people's heads that Rammstein's music is mediocre, but their live shows are so good. Yes, let's go into something where the the uh, the music is not mediocre. It's Ghost. So, yes. So Ghost, you might be saying, okay, Ghost sucks. So I, I decided not to include any anything that came after uh, Prequel. We're, we're looking at a, a live show from right before the Pope Star EP came out. So there's no Square Hammer. This was back when they were supporting Cerise and Mummy Dust. And Ghost was still a metal band. And they still had all of their original members, pretty much. So to me, if, if, if this was la- Ghost's last show, Ghost would go down in history as being legendary and amazing. And this particular show's a little bit more spectacly than anything they'd done because, you know, they brought a children's choir out to sing Monstrance Clock. Yes. And they were handing condoms out to the crowd. And it was, you would have hated that. <laughs> yes. I, I, <laughs> let's not but that get was into in 2016. It. Let's not get into it. <laughs> I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah. Ghost, unfortunately, I had to see them in, like, 2018 or something like that. Um, and according to Nick, they had um, deteriorated somewhat since then. Now, I had fun. It was a good show. And there were certainly sp- strong spectacle elements in it, and a lot of cool stuff happened. However, it was not this life-changing experience that uh, Nick was talking about. Well, you had to see them with their original members. Mm-hmm. Because again, I, I I've kind of I feel like Ghost has been on a, a steady downward trajectory ever since Martin Persner left the band. And uh, if you're not familiar with he is, he is referred to by the fans affectionately as Omega, or he was the rhythm original rhythm guitar player, and he just had this epic stage presence. And he wrote Year Zero. You know, he was one of the key songwriters, and he was Tobias Forge's best friend, I think. But you know, that kind of. I guess they are no longer friends. And uh, Apparently Ghost had some sort of childish fight that destroyed the band and whatever. But yeah, uh, in 2016 Ghost, they were as good as Iron Maiden on, on the, the performance level. You know, the, the drummer would you know, get up and pl- get so into it. He'd stand and play, you know. The keyboard player was this ominous six foot tall 60 year old guy who stood completely straight until it was time for the guitar solo and then he'd do this and then he'd stand completely straight and, you know like, remember ghost had moments where you don't need a keyboard there's no keyboard in the song yes so he would just stand there perfectly straight legs parted arms behind his back folded he'd come forward play his thing go back <laughs> This guy was terrifying, <laughs> especially when they had the cloaks. Before they had the silver masks, they just wore cloaks. And this guy was terrifying. It was great. Uh, but, you know, the, Tobias Forge is a, a great front man. He's a very energetic front man. Um, you know, his voice might not be for you. He's got a very nasally voice because he got something happened to his nose. And it made the voice weird. Yeah, a lot of people don't like ghost vocals. They also think it's not very high energy, which is correct. It's not very high energy, and it's not supposed to be high energy. It's supposed yeah, no. to be an eerie ghostly voice or something like that anyway. It's, it's supposed yeah. to be like a ghost. It's spooky. It's spooky Scooby-Doo music. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what Ghost is. Yeah, we, we, can, we can debate over whether or not Ghost is a metal band or a rock band, but at the end of the day, Ghost is about as heavy as Blizzard of Oz. Even at their lightest, you know, uh, Blizzard of Oz and even Prequel are kind of at the same level as far as you know how heavy they are. And if you want to call Blizzard of Oz 
a metal album, then you have to call Ghost a metal band. They're just yeah. on the lightest side of the spectrum. I don't know about Infestissimum. Infestissimum seems maybe less heavy than Blizzard of Oz. Perispera, I didn't freeze on that album. Well, yeah, that's true. I don't know. It gets less heavy as it goes on, and it turns. It's very psychedelic, rocky. Um, yeah, but there's nothing wrong with that um, if you're in a mellow mood to go and listen to Infestissimo. And Meliora is clearly metal, and uh, Opus Eponymous is clearly metal. And I consider Prequel metal too. It's just not not good metal. It's, it's hair metal. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Ghost's thing is their, their their fourth album was a significant step backwards, but Ghost kind of skipped the sophomore slump. They had three really good albums in a row. Yeah, well, and it, then they... it looks like a sophomore slump when you slump when you first hear it because you're expecting something metal, and actually what you get is very mellow. <laughs> yeah, but it's still got a lot of metal elements. It, it begins on a very heavy note. I mean, Ghost's yeah. heaviest song is Perspirate and Furry. That riff is just great. But anyway, uh, maybe. Anyway, with Ghost's live show, because we're we're talking about the live show, not their albums. Yes, we are. There is a lot of choreography. You know, each person on the stage has a very specific place they're supposed to be in every song. It's pretty obvious that they do this. Um, they've got the costumes. It just gets weirder and weirder as they go. You know, I, he brings a tricycle out now. I, I don't know. They're, they're they're nuts. The live shows are crazy. If you haven't seen them, go see them. It'll probably change your mind on them. And if it doesn't, well, you're just closed-minded. I think that's the way to put it with Ghost, right? Well, maybe. Or you just don't like him. You could just not like him. Sure, sure. I mean, I, mean, I hate Guns N' Roses, so... Look, like, the easiest way to not like Ghost without being closed-minded, like a closed-minded person who just doesn't like him because they're popular, is to not like their vocals. Because if you're not into that weird, nasal, very calm voice, if you don't think it's appropriate, then you're not going to like ghosts. I guess. And I don't know. I, I was a very big ghost fan for a long time and have very abruptly... Uh, been disheartened by them and have been kind of moving away from them. Yeah. So. Well, but yeah, and the other thing is, you know, maybe you just don't like the specific thing they're going for. But but ghosts are yeah. you know, high quality band. They're not they're not uh, a dumb band. They're, they they put their songs together well. Is what I'm trying to say. Yes, and they perform very well too. Or at least they used to. Yes. Uh, but we'll do a whole video defending Ghost. Yeah, so we will from from the vicious. Uh, what's the term? Metal elitists. Yes, the metal elitists. But I was going to try the slings and blows. I think I was trying to sure trying to, trying to do a Hamlet reference or something like that. I don't like. I get thee to a nunnery. I don't. <laughs> I don't even like Hamlet. But let's let's continue. Um, Wait, so Iron Maiden. <laughs> we'll talk about this later. Okay, Iron Maiden. Do you like Iron Maiden? Iron Maiden's the best band of all time, hands down. Unequivocally, they are the best live band ever. You know, Qu Queen might have Iron Maiden beat in the studio. Might. But Iron Maiden's the best live band, hands down. Iron it's just nuts objective. Life, nuts life. Bruce Dickinson particularly is nuts live so the video we're giving is is iron maiden on their f game i i found i i found a video where bruce is sick he's got the flu in this performance so when you watch it remember bruce dickinson has the flu you wouldn't notice you'd think ah, his vocals just aren't there tonight because you know the evil that men do is a little rough and that's my favorite iron maiden song a little rough but he still is amazing. He hit every note. He's up there in the high registers, changing costumes every five minutes. He's got a flamethrower. They do Flight of Icarus. They bring this stupid birdie thing up. And he's shooting fire and singing like a madman. He's got the big flag. They brought a full-sized Spitfire plane on the stage for Aces High. <laughs> 
a full sized plane. The only thing they downsized was the propeller. A plane. Keep in mind, he also drives the plane between his shows. He flies the yes. plane. <laughs> I mean, so, this man, this man, uh, like a month or two after he gets freaking cancer and he recovers from cancer, he decides to spend several months flying from city to city, then singing, running around in a red coat uniform in 90, 100 degree weather, singing opera with more aggressive tones and carrying various props around for three or four hours and then fly them to the next city while he's 60 years old and recovering from cancer. Tongue cancer. <laughs> Tongue cancer. Yes. And I'm sure... He's, he sings with that. <laughs> and I'm sure he's stuck in some fencing rounds on the way, too, or something like that. <laughs> you know, so I, I, I've seen... So this is the, the current Iron Maiden live show. This is from 2019. It's Rock and Rio. It's the Legacy of the Beast tour. So I'm going to go through the set list, and I'm going to tell you the crazy thing they do in each song. Okay, dope. Ace is high, starts out strong. They bring a friggin' plane onto the stage. Then we go into another classic. Where Eagles Dare. They've got a picture of uh, you know, one of those gondola things. Bruce has got an Ushanka hat on, and he's wearing a snow jacket thing. Two Minutes to Midnight is probably the least impressive track on the set list. I don't think they need to do any... I don't think they need to play this song again, to be honest with you. It's like it's like the ones one of two Iron Maiden songs. I think they never need to play again. Um, they've got a nuke looking thing in the background. Then we get interesting. They brought out the Klansman, a Blaze Bailey song about Scotland. Costume change again. Bruce has got a sword, and he fights Eddie with it. He fights Eddie with a sword in this nine-minute song about Scotland. But that's not all. Then the whole set changes. The whole whole stage is different. The lights go dark, everything changes. In the beginning, they had like, you know, fake vines and everything. And they had like these big barricades that like have barbed wire on them. All that's gone. Now it's a beautiful church. There's color everywhere. There's big statues of Eddie and columns that came out of nowhere. And we've gone from a war zone to a church. And they play Revelations. And Bruce has got this, like, you know, fancy costume. And it's my current wallpaper on my phone. It's Bruce Dickinson in this silly costume, singing Revelations. Then the Wicker Man. They've got the Wicker Man behind them. Does it they bring it? it out. And it's there. Do they burn it? No. Then that, the sign of the cross. That does seem dangerous. The sign of the oh, They've got pyrotechnics, though. they got pyrotechnics up the ass. Yeah, this show is the whole stage is on fire the whole time. Sign of the cross. He's got this hood on and he dances around in it. He's got this cross mic stand that's got lights in it, and he sings the saintly shrouded man silhouettes stand against the sky, and then these lights are flashing. The cross. That's great. It's beautiful. And again, why are they playing a Blaze Bailey song? Because they can. The Flight of Icarus. Again, giant bird man inflatable behind them. And he's got flamethrowers. Why not? Let's give we're playing a mid-tempo song. Let's give Bruce a flamethrower. <laughs> but not just any flamethrower. A two-barreled flamethrower that he can shoot with each of his hands. <laughs> and he's still gonna sing while he's got this double flamethrower. Cause he's Bruce. <laughs> number of the beast they've brought a bunch of gargoyles and devils onto the stage and the church has turned from a church into hell it's a hell church <laughs> all right so now we're in hell iron maiden and Fe uh, i'm sorry we forgot fear of the dark play fear of the dark he's got a lantern and you know he does spooky things iron maiden they bring out a giant eddie the eddie has got big arms and it's a, a ugly eddie face and it's a devil, Eddie. Great. 
but it's not over. We thought the show is over, but it's not. There's an encore. The evil that men do. Now Bruce looks like he is go- ready for the opera. You know, he's got the ruffly shirt and the vest, and he prances about singing the evil that men do, which is good. It should always be in the set list. How would it be that name? They pretty much hang Bruce. He's got a noose. They're about to string him up. And when you think, okay, this has to be the end, they play Run to the Hills. I mean, every single song, they do something crazy. Every single one. Oh, I forgot about the Trooper. They play the Trooper and for the greater good of God, too. I skipped over those ones, but they play those tracks as well. And those we tracks all know they what do he does with the good. Trooper. Yes, and for the greater good of God is an eight-minute song off of A Matter of Life and Death. And they can play that because why not? <laughs> Let's play for for the greater good of God because it's a, every track Iron Maiden has ever done is good, and they can just play anything from their back catalog. But there are tracks on Fear of the Dark that are not good. Shut up. <laughs> That's true. So, <laughs> Iron Maiden regularly exceeds your expectations. Every yeah. show they do something different, and Iron Maiden is the kind of band that doesn't even need a theme. Every album has its own theme and they can do like they've done an Egyptian theme. They've done a weird satanic Arctica theme. They've done a Mayan theme. They've done three themes at once. They've done a space theme. What next Iron Maiden? What (laughs) next? What are you going to do next? Please. <laughs> Let's go please what is next? <laughs> I want to see them do a samurai theme like Ninja the Shoe. <laughs> Don't Ninja the well, Shoe. You know, play a samurai talks. theme. <laughs> that's what I want to like, see. Like I can see Bruce dressed as a ninja. Oh yeah, that sounds fun. <laughs> like Ninja Bruce? Who doesn't want that? I want that. <laughs> you know, they, they tend to just stick to European history. They're history buffs for sure, but they tend to stick to European history. Well, except so for I'd Egypt. Be interested in the branch except out. for Egypt and Mayan. Egyptian and Mayan. Oh, that's true. That's true. Never mind. Never mind. I'm sure they will do something like that eventually because yeah. they're Iron Maiden and they can do anything. <laughs> yeah, I want to see I want to see an Eddie Samurai. <laughs> so you know, we've gone through Iron Maiden's set list. We've gone through their spectacle. But not only does Iron Maiden perform with all this wild stuff going behind them, their energy's there, too. Steve Harris puts his foot up onto the monitor, and he plays his bass like a gun, and he starts singing. You know, Adrian Smith just looks like the coolest guy in the world. He's got his goatee and his bandana. He's playing them. Yeah, I'm Adrian Smith. I can play. I'm cool. Dave Murray looks like the happiest man who ever lived. He's you know, kind of dorky, but he looks like he's the happiest guy in the world. And I, I'm Dave Murray, I'm playing the guitar. I'm having fun. And then there's Yannick Gares. He's doing the windmill. He's running underneath Eddie's legs. He's throwing his guitar in the air. But the tragedy of Iron Maiden and the one problem with their live show, Iron Maiden's drummer, Nico McBrain, he is the coolest guy in the world, perhaps cooler than Mr. Adrian Smith. He's funny. He's got the silly voice. He does silly things with his eyes. But you can't see him because his drums are huge. He's in this little outcove that they just put in the back of their stage, and you can't see him. Mm. And occasionally he pops his little head up, and you see, oh, there's Nico. That is the only problem with Iron Maiden shows. You can't see Nico. I've gone on my r- rant about Iron Maiden. Patrick, you may you may continue. <sighs> my job is done. So I've seen Iron Maiden once, and you've seen them three times. And uh, I think you were pretty exhaustive, to be honest with you, man. <laughs> Um, what would I add? Um, there's a lot of fire. He said that there's, he said that there's some pyrotechnics and it's constantly on fire. There is a lot of fire. That's, that's an important thing to, to keep in mind. Um, yeah. The only people who beat them with fire is Amon Amarth and Slayer. Yes. Also that show, the show you were listing I'm sure that was two hours. It felt short compared to like the Made in England show that I saw. The Made in England show had 17 songs. Um, 
Yeah, 17 songs. I know, way, like, I know way too much about Iron Maiden. Yes, yes. But <laughs> 17 songs, like, including a bunch of eight-minute songs, you know? Well, Have they played Phantom songs. of the Opera, and they played Seven, Seven Son of a Seven Son. Son. Uh, yeah, so I felt like that, that show must have been, like, three and a half hours or something like that. But like, then you get the, the Legacy of the Beast, which has the Klansman, which is nine minutes. For the Greater Good of God, which is nine minutes. And the Sign of the Cross, which is 11 minutes. Plus they played Revelations and Hallowed Be Thy Name, which are also both long. You know Warbringer played with Iron Maiden once? What? Where? When? <laughs> in, in so, somewhere in South America. I think it might have been some something in Brazil or something like that. I saw it and I was like, Whoa! <laughs> Why wasn't I there? <laughs> because it was in South America or something. <laughs> so Iron Maiden has this bad habit of either getting really good opening bands or terrible opening bands that no one's ever heard of. I think it's you know, they'll, they'll forever. Like, <laughs> no, I, 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 well, being Iron Maiden's opening act is the worst job in the world. Because <laughs> Iron Maiden fans are obscenely uh, vicious. Yes. They're uh, vicious. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Henry Rollins had a bit about that. <laughs> Yeah. Have you seen the Henry so, Holmes bit about uh, opening for Iron Maiden? I have not. Do tell. Oh, yeah, it's great. <laughs> I, I, I don't want to mess up his comedic timing or anything like that. So I kind of just want you to see it. But basically, he was just talking about um, how the fans of the bands are just um, total ridiculous nerds. And they're absolutely insane for Iron Maiden. And they're just constantly booming Hi. off the stage and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. Yeah. So if but you're an Iron Maiden I, opening band, I will share. You have to be you. really good. I will share it to you. Uh, maybe we can link it in the description too. There's a Henry Rollins bit. Let's do that. About how um, hard it is to open up for Iron Maiden, and it's pretty funny. Um, so yeah, yeah, I mean, their opening up for them is pretty bad because if you're not like close enough to Iron Maiden, though, people will just turn around or boo you. So no can open up for Iron Maiden, Megadeth. That's about it. Yeah. <laughs> well, so I've seen Ghost open for Iron Maiden. I've seen Alice Cooper open for Iron Maiden. That's I've, appropriate. It, they've had Kill Switch Engage open for them, and apparently they're bad live, so I can't say, but I'd be happy seeing Kill Switch with Iron Maiden. Yeah. Um, Warbringer would be great, but you know, sometimes That's they get their huge kids back. diversity. That's a huge gap. You've played with Warbringer. You are one degree removed from playing with Iron Maiden. Hey, I like that. I like that. That feels good. That feels good. You've opened for Warbringer. Warbringer's open for Iron Maiden. There you go. So one of the things I didn't mention was stacking bills. And maybe we'll do a whole show about stacking bills and like, you know, building a tour. But, you know, I actually prefer a diverse tour. One of the bands that does this the best is Megadeth. Megadeth usually brings four bands out with them. So there'll either be like Megadeth plus four bands or Megadeth plus three bands. And they'll never be the same. They'll always be like a very diverse roster. Like they one time brought out Metal Church, Amon Marth, Havoc, and uh, who am I forgetting? Suicidal Tendencies. That's not That's that a big diverse. That's pretty diverse. But then the next Megadeth tour, they brought out Meshuggah, Tesseract, and Lilic. Yeah, that's 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 more out there. Hearing Tesseract and then, with, uh, with uh, Megadeth, that's, that's pretty out there. And then a while back, there was Children of Bodom and Suicidal Tendencies. Or, and Havoc. They, they like bringing out Havoc and Suicidal Tendencies. Well, I don't I know mean, why. Imagine. Of course they might like bringing out Havoc. Havoc is just a secondary Megadeth in a lot of ways. Well, they were also on their label, but I believe they had a fight, and they're no longer friends. Oh. The one band Megadeth would never bring out, which pains me, was Dissection. Because Megadeth and Dissection are two of my favorite bands. And Megadeth kicked Dissection off of a festival once. Uh, yeah, because uh, Dave Mustaine's a uh, very, very uh, born-again Christian, and Dissection is... Um... Not. <laughs> not. <laughs> very not. No, very, very not. <laughs> About as not as you can get. <laughs> so, um... I think that's about all I have to say about live shows for today. We've exhausted it. I think next time we should talk about set list. Um... 
but that will be in a future episode because we are going to, you know, not just talk about live shows two weeks in a row because, you know, <laughs> so, give you a break. Dissection, dissection actually want to do what Dave Mustaine thinks that the world's politicians want to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that's accurate. <laughs> so, have you seen Dissection live? No. All right, if you had to guess, what category would they fall in? I would... Honestly, I bet they would fall into the, the four guys on stage. Close. Because... Regular rock show. Yeah. Oh. Because I know that the, he doesn't use course paint or anything, and I look at it and it's just... No, the, the... There's no costumes, there's, just uh, black t-shirts exactly, and black there's jeans. There's no costumes, so it's like y- you should be doing a spectacle show, but you're not. Something's wrong. Here. They have a big light show. They have a light show. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's I don't know, man. Pretty much all black their, their metal live shows are a lot like Gojira. Pretty much all black metal bands should be playing spectacle rock shows. I think so as well. I, I think that kind of is where they belong, or or just not playing live. Like, I think black metal. There, there's there's a case for a lot of black metal bands just never play live. Yeah, that's true. And I'm going bands, back and forth whether I want to play live with my black metal act. A couple bands could get away with a punk or spectacle punk shows. Like uh, Mayhem is one of those bands. Um, yeah, Mayhem could get away with a spectacle punk show. They don't have to. They play a spectacle rock show and it works pretty well. But they can yes. also get away with a spectacle punk show. Um, Destroyer Six 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 play a spectacle punk show and they're pretty fun live. Did you did you oh, see yeah? that? Were you were you there for Destroyer Six Six Six? No, no, no I was not. I'm not a huge Destroyer Six 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 fan, but they 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 put on a good show. You know, they're there. They're like, uh, they they're just guys ultimately. Like, yeah. they they're not um they're not corpse paint or anything. They don't look like mysterious anything like that. They look like guys you could talk to. But you know, they've got their their, their costumes are just a little over the top. They're just a little um like like leather biker jackets and shirtless thing with the bullet belts and all that kind of stuff. Um, they, they've got a little bit of fire going on, I think. And they, they, they he just goes in and he's like, metal's about rebellion and blah, blah, blah. And he just starts his song and, his, and they, they, they get the guys to sing along with it. And it's, it's funky. <laughs> it's, it's a little interesting. Funky. And it works for them. And I think there are some black metal bands that can pull off some kind of punk or spectacle punk shows, but most black metal, I think, needs to fall on the spectacle rock side of things. I, I think you're probably correct on that that front. Like if, if I were to play a with with my black metal act, which the album is almost done. It, by the time the next episode airs, it will be out. You know who's the best um, possible Okay, yes, sorry. Keep, keep going. Oh, I'm sorry. We would we would do like something close to what Megla does where we would just wear, you know, a very like dark dark clothes with no facial of visibility and you know do as much as we can to uh be evil looking well you can have on. a nature theme so you got to do things with the nature theme i want to wear a ghillie suit but that's I expensive say, i say you guys it's just one of you <laughs> well you know let's be real here if i do perform with repentant you're gonna be the first person getting a phone call so if you perform with repentant it will be just necrologica and we'll just change the costumes and say, now we're repentant, guys. <laughs> Actually, it'll probably be the reverse. It'll probably be repentant. Now we're necrologica, guys. <laughs> and then Congrats. I'll switch, and some people will come out, and it'll be, now it's Mind Razor, and you will be very tired. <laughs> well, repentant will need, uh, repentant will need uh, another guitar player. Okay. Um, what was I going to Oh, yes, I was going to say, you know who does basically a version of four guys on stage, but does it in like a way that just has a little something extra? Who's that? Immolation. <laughs> Immolation is wild. <laughs> <laughs> they were great, dude. They were great. So but I couldn't. I can't put them in any category besides four guys on stage. No, they, they are four guys on stage. But they're the except best one weird person. thing. What, what? So, personally, personally, I actually think I, I think Blind Guardians better than Immolation. Okay. But I- Immolation has their this guitar player who looks like Anton Lavey. <laughs> yes, that's exactly who he looks like. <laughs> except he stands there perfectly straight with a flying V, and then he goes.
<laughs> These very robotic movements. His body is stiff. His playing position is very stiff. But then he contorts his body in weird ways. He does things like that. He moves around like a lunatic. And he's just and it's it, he's he, just smiling. It's he's just smiling like in the slight sinister Levian Satanist way the whole time. He's just like I don't think they're even like they, he, I don't think anyone's like a Levian Satanist, but he looks exactly like Anton Levay. <laughs> you know, I, I've I've looked for videos of them doing this, and I he he doesn't do it as much in other shows. He just had it's a when we him. when we saw him. He did that. <laughs> it was really strange. It was really fun to watch. And it was a great We bit. loved it. And uh, yeah, I think most death metal bands fall into the um, four guys on stage category. And yeah, I was trying really hard to find a, gr- a good example of a, a, a traditional death metal band. Yeah, they usually and, uh, do that. They usually it's just four guys on stage. It's usually it's just four guys on stage. Um, Maybe they'll windmill their, their hair. Yeah. It's 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 hard to figure out you know where where a, a death metal band's gonna fit properly. I think atheists do a pretty good job because Kelly Schaefer's got an Aussie like personality, and that brings the whole thing up. <laughs> like he's just very happy to be there, interacting with the audience <laughs> type of thing. Oh, I love you all. I love you all. He yeah, much. down like a kind of frog. He doesn't. Yeah, he doesn't. He doesn't seem it's it's not that much, but he's like he's talking to them. He's just like so good to be out here, man. <laughs> you know, uh, Ozzy's kind of a similar deal. Ozzy's band is definitely four guys on the stage. However, who doesn't love watching Ozzy just exist? Yeah, <laughs> he's just such an odd fellow. And just observing him is strange because he's like a decrepit old man, but he tries. He jumps up and down like a frog. He's got a water hose that he shoots people with. He's also throwing buckets of water on his head for some reason. <laughs> Ozzy will go through like half of the first song dry, and then he's just throwing buckets of water on himself. <laughs> and then the crowd. He'll throw it on himself, then he'll chuck it at the crowd. It keeps him so, cool. <laughs> Ozzy shows, you gotta be careful, because you might end up in the splash zone. <laughs> you, I, I got wetter at an Ozzy show than I did going to SeaWorld. It'd be... <laughs> It would be. It would make more sense if it were like fake blood or something. It's not a fake blood. No nope, buckets of water. Just, just normal water. Just normal water. Just buckets of water. Yep. Not even. Like, Ozzy. Not even like a crazy sprinkler. He just takes buckets and throws water on people. You think I'm lying? Go watch. So Who does it? That's a way that you can have an interesting four guys on stage approach. If someone's just got a strange persona that just doesn't, <laughs> it's just interesting you're to watch. If you're Ozzy or if you're got the guy from Immolation. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, John Keevil, I think, fits in that category. Because Warbringer's kind of four guys on a stage as a band. Uh, Warbringer's a punk show, man. Warbringer's I guess. I guess. And they're not, they're not, you saw their bases. He was crouched down like he was two feet tall. That's how crouched down he was the entire time. That's true. And he was just constantly. So here, here's, I think we should leave them with this. Who do you think is the, of the people in these shows, who was the most metal performer, individual, and who was the least metal performer? All right, let's see. Um, the least metal performer would be Blind Guardian Focus. He's he's not very metal. He's, he's... Uh, I'm actually gonna make the argument for Necro Butcher. <laughs> he doesn't look like he belongs in a metal band. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he doesn't look like he's in a metal band. Necro Butcher is such an interesting looking fellow. He's not an he's not an ugly man. I'm not trying to say he's ugly. He's got a very very uh European look to him. And uh, he's got that ponytail, and uh, he's not willing to get rid of it. And uh, I don't know what his deal is. He just doesn't ring me as very metal until you hear him talk. <laughs> but but he's, he's into it, you know. As for the most metal performance, that's a lot harder, because I don't know whether I want to go with the spectacle rock variety or the punk variety. Both seem like yeah. fully like they they're they're fitting, like you know it's it's hard to say one is more metal than the other. Maybe 
Maybe Code Orange, honestly. And I'm not sure which member of Code Orange. That's funny. Oh, it's the girl. Probably, yeah, probably. It's it's Reba. It's yeah, Reba. Yeah, so Reba, you're not even really like you're you're borderline not a metal musician. But probably that's the best example because you've got the spectacle aspect yeah. and the punk aspect to it. Yeah. <laughs> you you could also say the singer of Power Trip. However, he dresses like a homeless man. Yes, but he's 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 Yes, he's a certain. Well, that's why I said I don't know why I, if I want to go spectacle or if I want to go punk. You know. Yeah. If the best representation of the spectacle side of it, the the most metal you can get is Bruce Dickinson. Dickinson. Yeah. But the Bruce Dickinson, huh? Bruce Dickinson, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but Bruce is is. But the light, most metal you can go on the 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 punk side is is Power Trip. You know. So to try to get a little bit of a compromise, but we'll, we'll say Reba is the most metal. Whoever the guy from Blind Guardian is, is Hans something. Hansi. Hansi Kirsch. Hansi Kirsch. I'm going to get it eventually. Yes. So Hansi Kirsch. Um, he's your dad. Yeah. He, he looks like a dad. <laughs> and he's, he's literally just having a conversation. So, <laughs> so yeah. No, he, 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 it's, it's really a conversation because when they do the Bard song – He'll say a line and then walks away, and the crowd sings. Why am I holding a screwdriver? Why are you holding a screwdriver? Why am I holding a screwdriver? <laughs> <laughs> Questions for the crowd. Let us know in the comments. Why is Nick holding a screwdriver? <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you next week. Next week, the the answer will be will come next week. Nick DeVere, a screwdriver. Why am I holding it? Find out next week. What's in my bag? Mind razor. <laughs> screwdriver. <laughs> um, yes. So join For us. For all week. your fixings. <laughs> join us next week when we talk about uh, the ranking of various metal genres and why Nick has a screwdriver. Yes. Yeah. All right. So we... Uh, about to, we about ready to end this then? I thought we'd ended it already. Oh no, we're, we're still going. <laughs> yeah. So we didn't, uh, say, we're, we didn't say we're we didn't say we're out yet, but I guess we'll do that now. Um, so I am Patrick. I'm Nick. And this has been Dialectic Chaos. We'll and I have you. a screwdriver. And he has a screwdriver. And we'll see you next time. <laughs>